you see that then. Hopefully that's visible to everybody. Yes. Great. Uh, uh, Kroiso uh, and Powell, welcome everybody. I'll give you a quick introduction to the, uh, uh, the rest of the afternoon's events. Um, and uh, then I'll make a quick uh, kickoff on my 20 minute uh, introductory talk. Um, the rundown of the events uh, today is I'm gonna open and just discuss where we are with the current iteration of the uh, research framework. Uh, and it's good to see so many people here uh, this evening. Thanks for joining. Uh, there are 5.30 thereabouts. I'm gonna welcome uh, Oliver Davis uh, and Neil Sharples uh, from Cardiff University to talk about the excavations at Kairi Hillfort, 2012 to 2019. Uh, and that'll be a short presentation. Uh, and then after uh, Oliver and Neil, we've got another two short presentations, but both are pre-recorded. So I'm hoping the technology works tonight. I couldn't get the, tech, the, the audio to work, unfortunately. We're meant to have uh, Andrew Reynolds, PhD uh, researcher at Reading University, to talk about Bronze Age and Iron Age hordes of Wales in the Marches. And then finally, uh, Ken Murphy from the David Archaeological Trust uh, to talk about three Hillfort excavations uh, that have taken place last year. Uh, so I'm really hoping that we have those two final presentations. Then we really hand over to the uh, audience, uh, delegates as it were, um, uh, to ask you uh, four questions about how this fits into the wider process. Do you think anything's been left out? Uh, and then we'll have a general Q&A as well. So hopefully that's all okay. And hopefully you can hear me. If not, so please, Johan, just let me know. Um, otherwise I'll make a start, just to introduce where we are uh, with the first millennium BC, uh, later Bronze Age and Iron Age uh, research framework for Wales, the new iteration. Now uh, I'm presenting this uh, as the sort of the, the sort of chair of the, the, the panel, uh, but I'm very much in debt to uh, the other 28 members of the research panel and also the, uh, the volunteer committee for the research framework Wales for all the guidance they've given me and us to date. And here we see a fantastic Carnix being played at uh, Casa Hensley's uh, three weeks ago. Well, uh, after lockdown, uh, well, still virtual meetings, but it's been very good to get together with the members of the panel for the Late Bronze Age and Iron Age Research Framework to talk. We've all really actually enjoyed discussing uh, the latest themes, outstanding issues uh, in this uh, period uh, and getting together again, getting our heads together. We've had two meetings last year. Uh, the final document currently is about seven and a half thousand words and we have eight new themes as well. Um, and you can see on the right there, my furiously scribbled notes, trying to get down every thought uh, as they came in and decant that into the document we now have uh, as a draft uh, for the, for the uh, research framework. Uh, but as you'll see at the top, uh, we all thought still the, the same questions persist as a century ago, who, how, what, and why? But I guess, uh, you know, to keep that spirit of investigation going, those questions will always be there. Uh, but there are still some fundamentals we need to, to tackle. Now we come to uh, look back on quite a busy time in first millennium re uh, BC research uh, in Wales and the marches. Just see there on the left, you can read it as I talk uh, from the document, uh, the major uh, pieces of research that have undertaken uh, since 2014, both excavations and evaluations uh, at the top, but also all of other relevant projects. We've seen the opening of the archeology span galleries at St. Fagans. We've had the launch of the Hillfort Atlas project online and now in a final publication. Uh, so we've, had, we've got a lot of other projects going on in this very interesting period. Uh, and you can see a few uh, images there at the top, photograph at the top here, uh, excavations at Port Arau, uh, in Pembrokeshire last year by the David Archaeological Trust and the National Trust. Uh, Gary Locke's uh, Molagar Bodvari uh, excavations, nice photogrammetry there. That's uh, up in the northeast of Wales. A shot of Rachel Pope's important work on Penaclodii Hillfort up in the northeast. Uh, there's the Hillfort Atlas of uh, Britain and Ireland with Penna Creek, a Welsh Hillfort pride on its cover. But also the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, referred to throughout as the PAS, the new finds that are still coming up, a, a, a scabbard. Uh, tip uh, from Tal Garth found a few years back. And these are really uh, helping us to find the landscape between the monuments. Uh, and just to reiterate uh, what a vibrant time this is for uh, later Bronze Age and Iron Age studies. 
just some shots from last year alone. Uh, upper left, we have the Gwynedd Archaeological Trust, National Trust and Cherish Project excavations at Dinner Sinsley. Uh, Dan, Dan Amor from GAT talking to a large group across the walls of the roundhouse. Couldn't resist this muddy group of volunteers having re-turfed Port uh, last year after rainfall. We've had uh, Dick Ventures working at Kaiwai Promontory Fort in Pembrokeshire. The Pendinus excavations in Aberystwyth were overwhelmed with volunteer requests uh, from nearby Pemparky community. Uh, and we've also had uh, the, the opening of the Kairai uh, Visitor Centre in Cardiff in Ely, the Hillfort themed community centre, and all the activities that surround that, uh, which have really emanated from a solid 10 years of work. Uh, and there's many others, Beacon Ring being excavated by Third Powers Trust and so on. So it's a very busy time uh, for this period. Uh, so we were tasked with a new iteration of the research framework, building on the excellent 2010 and 2014 reviews. Uh, but we were tasked with widening the boundaries, or well, that's what we set ourselves as a task, I think, uh, to broaden the framework out to make sure it includes relevant European themes, themes of interregional contact, placing Wales in the wider world, uh, if you like, uh, with its neighbouring regions of England uh, and Scotland and the Irish Sea Zone as well. We looked at how to improve and refine uh, chronologies um, uh, to reinvigorate material culture themes. Uh, we'll look at this as I go through the talk. Uh, material culture is critical to this period, uh, but we're facing a bit of a crisis in terms of uh, aging specialists uh, and also uh, a better understanding of the material that's coming out of the ground or reasons why it doesn't uh, come out of the ground sometimes as well. We want to break free of being uh, restricted by visible monuments, the hill forts and the defended settlements and explore the landscapes beyond uh, the ramparts, of course. And we must make efforts as well to incorporate new climate change themes and stronger paleo-environmental work at some of the first millennium BC sites. Uh, climate change becoming more important in the last decade, uh, perhaps maybe the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, but even for myself working alongside geographers and the Cherish project, it's, it's been a really enlivening experience actually. So, multidisciplinary approaches to these sites, rather than just leaving it all up to the archaeologists uh, to, to broaden our understanding of what's going on at these monuments. We're also recognizing the widening, the, the better availability of uh, remote, section, uh, remote, remote sensing uh, prospection technology. Uh, Sub-meter airborne laser scanning is now more affordable. Uh, drones, UAVs are ubiquitous uh, for photogrammetry. Car-based geophysics, is being now rolled out, so uh, it's not difficult to get a large area survey. And even Google Earth uh, is, has got an amazing image resource for scanning for crop marks and other monuments. And also, one of the things that came out in our discussions is recognising the major unpublished excavations from the 60s to the 2000s. I won't name and shame uh, tonight. Uh, some of us know what they are. Um, but, you know, before proceeding with big new digs, there's an awful lot of archives out there that still need working through uh, sorting and publication to get them out to the wider audience. So we have eight new themes. I'll just go through those now for the next 10 to 15 minutes, just in summary. I, I'm, I'm never an advocate for reading out from PowerPoint slides, but these are the props because there's quite a lot to cover. So do bear with me. Um, but we'll go through them in turn. Uh, and the, the first of our, our themes is a, a bit to improve and refine the chronology in first century BC uh, or first century first millennium BC Wales as well. One of the key things that came out of our discussions was trying to change the scale of excavation within hill, hill forts, looking for bigger trenches that open wider areas so that change uh, uh, and a difference within hill fort interiors can be better understood at a, at a larger scale. And we acknowledge this can, some, can sometimes be difficult when you're looking at excavations within protected sites. Uh, but the benefits are enormous. Uh, and we haven't had many big hillfort digs in the last 20 years in Wales. We also want to look at better, more innovative dating solutions. Uh, there's been good progress in the application of Bayesian chronologies, combination of various dating techniques to get a, a, a more refined understanding, particularly in that uh, early middle Iron Age plateau where radiocarbon dating is not so effective. And that's being applied at a number of sites, including Messionis up in the scene. 
we've been, been making some progress with single grain or, um, optically stimulated luminescence dating, OSL. There's on the right that photograph is Jeff Duller from Aberystwyth University, worked on Skomer Island in 2017, uh, getting very, very good dates, uh, very precise dates uh, for uh, things that happened 1,000 or 15 or 2,000 years ago and even further. And a better understanding of ceramic chronologies, especially for the Middle Iron Age uh, to the Late Iron Age period as well, as a call for that. There was also a bid for greater granularity in regional settlement chronologies. That's more on, on the sort of model that we saw at Plough Haddon excavations in Pembrokeshire in the 1980s, where you have a group of monuments, maybe eight or ten hill forts, a couple of miles apart, but actually rapidly looking at dating and understanding those, a sort of strip map date and publish model that's been uh, championed by Billy O'Brien in Ireland, particularly in James O'Driscoll. Very effective for looking at regional or, or sort of local groups of forts. But also as well, uh, looking at carbonized plant remains, uh, drawing this out as being actually very important, a real reason for continued excavations of settlements uh, and the recognition that these carbonized plant remains are a repository of, uh, of knowledge about how crops uh, developed in Wales. Uh, and they can often be some of the best dating material that we have uh, for these sites. Our second theme was reinvigor reinvigorating material culture studies. Principally understanding the artifact gaps. Uh, it was commented that sometimes a developer funded work, they come back with no fines. So why haven't we got any fines from a settlement? Um, that's a result in itself. And we know from sites like the Bride and we have wooden objects and artifacts coming out where we have a ceramic settlement. Uh, but uh, we must understand these artifacts gaps better, these aceramic communities better. But also, as I said at the start, we need more enthusiasm for artifact studies. Where are the artifact specialists, the Iron Age pottery specialists, the Roman pottery specialists in their 20s and 30s? And if it's difficult to get hold of specialists now, we need to make sure that universities are looking to train these people up or, or get, inject some enthusiasm into the process as well. Uh, we talked about uh, in investigating and contextualizing artifact deposition sites away from known monuments. And here the, the portable antiquity scheme is really very important uh, for uh, showing us movement uh, and artifact deposition away from uh, these focal points, these visible sites. Broadening that out, we have continuing uh, issues with understanding mobility, contact and exchange. Wales's connections to Devon, the Southwest, Northwest England and Ireland. And yes, these are themes that were discussed in the 50s and the 60s, the Irish Sea Zone uh, and the conferences held, uh, but there are still some basic things we don't understand in this area. There was a call to raise the profile of finds in museum archaeology. Uh, we have there the, the Shropshire Buller uh, on show the British Museum at the moment. <clears throat> it was commented that people absolutely love well-presented artifacts. They we find them exciting and engaging. So how do we get regional museums particularly to show more Iron Age objects? Uh, and prioritize those. Also aligned to material culture uh, is this question of bone, animal bone and human bone. In Wales, we have very acidic subsoils, so bone is not very well preserved. And given that, uh, there was a comment that when we do have bone on an archaeological site, we should have 100% recovery of that for future study. Um, and also potentially a priority given to limestone geologies of Wales. We see the limestone geologies of Wales are very, uh, are very, very constrained. So should we be prioritizing excavations on first millennium BC sites in the limestone geologies to recover uh, bone? And then also this question of excavation backlogs, better funding for that. The third theme, dashing on through this, the third theme is metals, minerals in this industry. We recognize that Wales is an exceptional repository for later prehistoric mining evidence. Not only the early medieval mines of Mid Wales, Anglesey, and the Great Orm, uh, but the iron uh, exploitation of the iron settlements, uh, particularly those investigated by Peter Crew in Snowdonia in the 80s and 90s at Crow Quest uh, and uh, up at Brinna Castex, especially Snail Shell Smelter's Hut there as well. Uh, we have amazing finds coming out. We have a, an oak spade from Talabont in Keradigan discovered in 2019 by Johan Lord, uh, dating to the late Iron Age. Uh, from a mine. So we have incredible finds coming out 
and we certainly push to understand this better. We need to understand the metal composition in our artifacts better. We have problems with iron artifacts. These are not often recovered from metal detecting, uh, where people are often going for bronze or copper alloy objects and the like. So how do we get a better recovery of iron objects and understand production of iron better? And also looking at issues of trade and shipping in metals. The PAS project is showing concentrations of material, say in Swansea Bay and South Gower, where you may have beach markets and coastal trading in the first millennium BC. So these are other areas where we need to investigate further. Our fourth theme, see four, four in, we get to Hillfort. That's how, that's how liberated we are in this process now. We, we only got to discuss Hillfort in our second meeting. And you see Oliver Davis there was complaining we hadn't got around to them in the first meeting as well. Um, but we have new things to do with Hillfort. We, we want to do more large scale excavations to better understand these. We see two good examples here, uh, Rachel Pope's work at Penetrodii and Kate Waddington and Ray Carl's work at uh, Messionis. Uh, the benefits we can get from expanding our area of excavation within Hillforts to understand the development better and understand the more elusive structures like stake built and turf built buildings that may not show on remote sensing. There are issues of regionality in Wales. Wales is a great country to study regional settlement patterns in because of the diverse topography. Uh, new work is emerging for the later Bronze Age now through Penaclodii and also new PhDs like Larry Campbell's uh, PhD as well. And a recognition that we have long and complex chronologies for many of these sites. This is emerging at Cairo, I'm sure Ollie and, uh, and Neil will talk about this, but also the developed hill forts of Northwest Wales, sites like Chirkadri, nominally Iron Age and Romana British, uh, but probably aspects of the Manilithic and Bronze Age, and no doubt they uh, see occupation of the early medieval period. But again, more work is needed at these sites to understand this. Theme five of R8 was extending remote sensing. Uh, there's a real need to get this rolled out now more across Wales. We see for airborne laser scanning, which is now more affordable for half meter or 25 centimeter resolution. Great new pieces of work by the Cherish Project in the offshore islands of Wales and the Carnevi HLS project in Snowdonia for a large upland block, which has now been surveyed for LIDAR. There's huge potential for large scale geophysical surveys. Uh, the work of Tim Young in the Vale of Glamorgan was mentioned uh, for surveying open country where we don't necessarily have monuments to see what's hiding out there. But also lessons learned from major landscape projects uh, where Huge transects have been pushed through Wales, both the liquefied natural gas pipeline and the five mile lane assessment by Rubicon Heritage, uh, where you're stripping and mapping, but also seeing in the excavation sites that weren't evident on geophysical survey. Uh, really instructive, these, to show how the wider First Millennium BC landscape is being used in between those crop mark sites, uh, those uh, known finds. Uh, so really important work going on there in these areas. Our sixth theme, a new one dropped into the first millennium BC were, was for landscapes of deposition, including wetlands and wet landscapes. Uh, a lot of new work being done here. Tiffany Treadways uh, recently completed a new PhD at Cardiff on wetland finds from Wales as well. Uh, and I think there's a real strong call actually for better funding, better research uh, to, to these landscapes of deposition in Wales. We've actually commented, you know, a bit like we have this incredible national resource of metal exploitation, the Snowdonia Iron Working Site, at the Great Horn Mines, the Mid Wales Metal Mines. So in Wales, we have an incredible resource for wetland archaeology, but are we exploiting that properly? Are we investigating that as, as much as we can? It was noted that, you know, bogs and wetlands don't just occur in remote uplands. We have them close to conurbations in Wales in the lowlands. Uh, this is a map clip from uh, west of St. David in Pembrokeshire, an area that always looks fascinating, around Plega Boya and Elithic Settlement. Lots of uh, wetlands and, and, and inland lakes. How much work has been done to look at these uh, sort of sites here? Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, new work being done to re-wet wetland areas with diggers and quite intrusive me mechanical work. So what's being lost where this work is being done? Uh, we've had uh, redating of old finds. Stratoforida figure, for example, from Keradigion, originally thought to be a North American import, 
dated in 2005 uh, as late Iron Age, a box with figurines, and only really come to the fore through uh, sort of new work by Tiffany Treadway there to say this this site this find is important and it should be should be given greater uh, profile. And we've discussed other sites, famous sites like Sink Eric Bath, which we we feel, felt could still benefit from new work, new paleo environmental work on the environs, uh, and new contextual work on the finds. And also, there's a lot of opportunity coming out of the PAS project too, especially through work by staff at the National Museum of Wales, particularly in understanding late Bronze Age hordes, for example, in Southeast Wales, where we have a golden age of artifact deposition between 1000 and 700 BC, and more than 40 hordes coming out from this part of Southeast Wales. So incredibly exciting new work. The penultimate theme, uh, almost at the end of my talk here, the penultimate theme here, is a new focus on burial evidence. Uh, anybody who's done work on Iron Age burials knows that there's not a lot of them. Uh, Oliver Davis uh, wrote a, a, a very important paper a few years back now, summarising and studying the burial evidence in Wales. It's been followed up by a new PhD by Adele Bricking, which has been uh, producing some nice new results as well. Uh, we can see from the Adele's map of Iron Age burials in South Wales, there aren't that many of them. And of course, we come back to this issue of preservation in acidic soils, unless we have alkali deposits, of course. Uh, but there's a call for you know, better contextualization of Welsh burial evidence, linking into UK-wide programs of isotopic analysis and osteoarchaeological studies. New recognition of burial in the landscape, uh, late Bronze Age burial uh, cemeteries emerging in the Vale of Lamorgan from PAS work and past excavation work by the National Museum and others. A recognition of cave burial traditions, which may have uh, popped up in uh, antiquarian studies or, or classic studies in the 20th century, but have not been revisited uh, that well. And also, uh, uh, big new finds like the chariot burial, the, uh, the searching for chariot project, a uh, searching for chariots project in southwest uh, Wales, being driven by the David Archaeological Trust, was funded by CADU, uh, is seeking to identify further Iron Age burials outside Hillfort with solid results. And we now have several hill forts where we have good uh, burials outside recently identified, uh, and we now need to test whether they're Iron Age or not. Uh, just a, a slide provided by Adele here uh, of some burials from Denorbin, uh, and her work's focusing on whether, uh, through chemical analysis, to test whether bodies were interred and decayed as an, uh, an entire object, or whether they fell to pieces or excarnated during decay and the bones are moved around. So really interesting new work coming out there as well. And finally, the final theme uh, for the first millennium BC group is a new theme, uh, identity and contemporary perspectives. We see the role of uh, the late Bronze and Iron Age in contemporary society, uh, fully part of other research uh, uh, agendas like the SCARF, the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework in Scotland, uh, looking at uh, current models, current education and so on. Now, if you think it's something that should be involved in the Welsh framework as well. Uh, starting at the top, we have these questions of <coughs> prehistory and its, its developing role in the narrative of Wales as a nation, uh, a very strong political narrative nowadays. You'll see I've got a couple of anonymized uh, comments from last year from Twitter. Last year, there was a discussion on Twitter after a post of Dinah Stintley Hillfort, for example, of you know, why haven't Iron Age people in Wales got a name? Um, we call Romans Romans, uh, we call uh, these called Saxons Saxons, but they're asking, well, are these Brythonic people, are they Celtic people? Do we call them by Iron Age tribal names? So we're used to talking about Iron Age people, uh, but in some uh, parts of Wales particularly, they want more of a sense of identity uh, from their past than they're currently being provided with. It's an interesting discussion to have. Also, the role of reconstructions in teaching at a primary level. Uh, we've got a really good um, paper on, uh, on sort of reconstructions at, uh, and reconstructed roundhouses as classrooms by Steve Burrow from 2015, I think. Very useful paper following on from the redevelopment of St. Fagans. Uh, and also, we've got new buildings being uh, reconstructed at Castle So, how do these buildings represent Iron Age life? Uh, how do they convey Iron Age life to primary school children and visitors? Again, useful things to be thinking about. And also engaging uh, or involving Iron Age work or first uh, million BC themes more into education. Uh, there's a new Kenevan curriculum uh, being developed in Welsh schools now, 
based on local environments mixing or blending history, language, geography, and art and so on into local landscapes. And that possibly is a way that we could get involved more uh, with implementing or effecting change to the uh, new curriculums. So interesting new ideas around identity and contemporary perspectives in this uh, current uh, framework. There's quite a lot of information there in uh, that summary. Uh, the results of quite a few hours of meetings and, and discussion with the research framework group. And I'm indebted to everybody on this list. Uh, I'm speaking their words and also these areas. Uh, and it's been a really invigorating process to get together and talk about these further.